and then uh, our conclusion. And you'll have to forgive my voice, but after uh, a week of FMX, it's finally giving out just in time for my talk. <laughs> Okay, so of course, when people think of uh, filmmaking production, uh, what we all want, of course, is to create a great work of art, but also to have some coins in the coffer when we're done. Uh, all too often, though, this is what happens. You know, we burn through cash, um, uh, not intentionally, of course, uh, but often quite unintentionally, um, uh, sort of burning through that stack. Um, clearly, what we want is to avoid that as much as possible, and there are certain things to keep in mind as we go through that journey of making the film in order to, uh, to do so. Um, John Foster Dulles, a uh, great businessman, said the mark of a successful organization isn't whether or not it has problems, uh, it's whether it has the same problems it had last year. And I think this is very true. This is not about not making mistakes. This is not about you know, not getting into trouble, but it's about being very clear-minded and insightful about the situation you're in to try to avoid repeating those problems year after year and sort of having history repeat itself within your organization. Let's talk about organizations for a minute. Um, a balanced system. Uh, organizational system consists of a central mis mission and then these five aspects, your strategy, your structure, uh, a system of measuring, your, your metrics basically for success and for growth, uh, people, you know, your human resources, and then your culture, your institutional culture. Uh, Pixar being a great example of a company that has a very well-known institutional culture, Disney as well. Actually, really, you think of any, any company these days, Sony has a particular culture, digital domain, uh, and so forth, woof. Um, now what happens is that when these get out of balance or are absent, companies and organizations can get in certain states. So um, if your mission, if your central mission is absent, you sort of have a state of lifelessness in the organization. Um, if you don't have a strategy or if your strategy is weak, you're certainly in an aimless situation. Uh, shapeless is when there's no structure to your company. You have these other components, but the structural sort of bones are not in place uh, for your organization. Um, if there's no way of measuring not only the success of your films, but also a way to measure how well people are doing within the organization and can advance and be promoted. People have a feeling of worthlessness or hopelessness. I'm working away and nobody's recognizing it. If the measures are absent, we have that problem. Um, if there is uh, unrest within the ranks, uh, certainly you have a, an issue there within your human resources. And finally, if there's no sense of identity, if there's no sense of institutional culture, right, that, that what, what is our family about? as this organization, then you have a sense of facelessness. You also get in situations where those elements may all be present and may be in proper proximity to each other, but your entire organization is sort of out of sync with the world. Maybe it's exhausted, it's sort of done its duty, and it's irrelevant. Um, that can happen. And then, and I see this a lot with my clients in India and also in uh, China, if one component is outsized and takes over, that can also be an issue. Um, some of the cultural factors, for instance, in China are so overbearing that it really kind of throws organizations off kilter as they're trying to uh, compete not only internationally but also just within China itself. Excuse me. So, of course, um, people are your most expensive and also your most valuable asset in any organization. So it's really important to treat them well and, and not so much like this. Uh, but unfortunately, this is how a lot of companies and studios do treat their personnel is like, you know, resources on assembly line that when they burn out, you can just pop them out and pop a new one in. Uh, and we really want to try to avoid that as much as we can and treat people more like collaborators. Uh, this is Woodrow Wilson, great American president, uh, and he said, I not only use all the brains I have, I use the brains, all the brains I can borrow. Uh, and this is a really good philosophy. As a supervisor myself, it was never my job to be the smartest guy in the room. I certainly wasn't. I'm not the smartest guy in this room. Uh, but what I would try to do is, is facilitate and coordinate the brains who are in the room towards the goal and the objective that we were facing. And I think that's the wisest uh, course of action. Um, as far as team balance goes, these charts that I'll be showing you are available on my website, and I'll point you to them at the end. Um, this is a team balance wheel. So basically this pie consists of little slices, productivity, creativity, accountability. These are all aspects of a healthy team. And you can rate your team on a scale of one to 10 in terms of where uh, those factors lie for you. And you sort of get almost like a vector scope on the current health of your organization, of your team. Ideally, you want that to be a nice fat round circle pushed out towards the nines and the tens um, as opposed to just sort of like, you know, clover shape. But uh, this is a good baseline, right? You know, this is where you are. So there's nothing to be ashamed of if you evaluate yourself and you're here. 
um, as long as you know that this is your vector that you're headed towards. Um, talk about this performance curve for a minute. There's an interesting phenomenon where as pressure increases in any endeavor, and in this case production, productivity actually goes up. A little bit of pressure is good. It motivates us to you know, pay attention, to apply ourselves, uh, and that's all to the, to the good. Uh, unfortunately, when pressure increases too much, we get anxiety, uh, people become upset, and there's a stress zone. You can see there's that point where the curve starts to fall off. That represents the point where, where this happens, uh, where people just sort of get completely fed up, completely uh, fried, and, and lose it. And we've seen this. Anybody who's worked here in production or even in school, or probably anybody who's alive, has seen this sort of thing happen or done it uh, themselves. Now, of course, <laughs> even though cultural problems are the cheapest to fix. You don't have to buy hardware and software to do it. They're often the hardest because there are ingrained sort of attitudes and, and uh, paradigms that we have that are hard to shake. Here's a good example. Let's say you have an eight-hour workday, <laughs> a fantasy I know in visual effects. Let's say you had an eight-hour workday, um, uh, four hours before lunch and four hours afterwards. There have been studies where they actually ran two crews against each other, two groups of people uh, performing a task. One group was working straight through and then had with a break for lunch. The other group was taking 10-hour breaks every hour. I'm sorry, 10-minute breaks every hour. Yeah, 10-hour break would be awesome. Uh, but they were taking 10-minute breaks every hour. The, and they were moving bricks in this case. Um, the group that was working straight through moved a certain amount of bricks. The group that was taking that 10-minute break per hour moved more bricks at the end of the day than the group that took no breaks because they had that time to replenish. And this applies not only to physical labor, but they've also applied this study to people doing mental work. Having said that, when you present this to managers and producers, you'll run into people more commonly than not who refuse to accept this and say, I'm not paying people to take 10 minutes out of the, you know, each hour. Even though the overall productivity at the end of the day shown in the studies is higher, they can't get their heads past this. Uh, and this is what we face. Another thing, uh, and Rudy talked about this uh, yesterday in his great talk on uh, uh, leadership, is when you're working towards a goal, this is our little leader over here, uh, team leader, and he's working with um, his partner, right, one of the people on his crew. They're both trying to get to the goal, but let's say the person who he's working with has a slightly different way of seeing it, right, a slightly different way of getting there. If this manager insists, this supervisor insists on pulling this person towards his point of view throughout the process, more time can actually be wasted through this back and forth, this oscillation, than if he trusted that individual and sort of, you know, uh, gave him the mandate to, you know, go charge towards this, I trust you. Now, of course, the uh, supervisor is worried about this, right? He's worried about overshooting the moon, kind of missing the target. So there's a balance that has to be maintained between that trust factor and also making sure the person who uh, is charged with doing the work has a clear understanding of what he's trying to get towards. Because um, otherwise this can happen. You can just have, this is an intersection in Shanghai, um, which is representative of how disorganized uh, a show can become if there's not effective management and leadership. 